Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the research seminar series of the School of Political Science and International Studies here at the University of Queensland. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Leonie uh, Holthaus from the University of Darmstadt and a visiting fellow at our school. I should also say that it's been great having Leone. Um, many of us have had interesting discussions with her throughout your time here, so thank you for that, Leone. And without further ado, further ado, I'll pass on to Leone, who will be speaking today on international analogies, international thought, and the reconfiguration of democratic ideas. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to take the opportunity and thank you for having me here. And I would like to say that it is very great and I already learned a lot during a lot of interesting conversations. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to present some or one project or paper today. And I'm very much looking forward to your criticism and comments. I like to put it straightforward that I built on ideas which and the paper um, which is more or less finished but that I still consider the work to be very much work in progress. And this is also why I like to discuss it and why I'm looking forward to comments and criticism. So the title, International Analogies, International Thought and the Reconfiguration of Democratic Ideas is a quite obvious reference to Hideo Miguel domestic analogy. The domestic analogy is defined as a form of presumptive reasoning and usually shows how world order proposals are based on domestic ideas. So international analogies might be a little counterintuitive to some, so I like to introduce how I arrived at the idea and why I think it is interesting to explore them, and also how far I like to stretch the argument and where I stop. So the idea builds on an earlier research on international functionalism where I studied in British international thinkers, especially early 20th century thought. And I found it highly interesting that they approached international relations from the perspective of democratic theory and that they interacted um, democratic theory or linked democratic theory in a number of complex ways to debates about empire, the League of Nations, and also about industrial modernity. So I think there's much complex thought um, going on. And this also um, is a reason for me to question the claim that IR evolved as a discourse about the problem of sovereignty among different states. So I very much disagree with this reading. And I found their thought very interesting. And on the same time, I was a little um, well, troubled or I found it a little strange um, that democratic theory and IR theory are said to be um, again met in the 90s in debates about global democracy. And I once was wondering whether the e disciplines really started speaking to each other or, um, or not. Um, other authors have also made the point in one essay, another paraphrase of Martin Wright's essay, why is there no international democratic theory? And I still think some of the claims hold true. And I believe one reason for this is that a lot of thinkers use the domestic analogy specifically in the debates about cosmopolitan democracy. So the critics do it in order to say, well, the conditions for cosmopolitan democracy are not given, and the advocates somehow accept the method of reasoning and then want to show what they are given. So everybody is using the domestic analogy. This kind of reinforms a lot of problematical um, assumptions, I believe, and it also affirms a division of labor between both disciplines and the view that democratic theories may mo mostly about the state and evolved along with transformations of the state. And studying early 20th century British thought, I found um, one quite different evidence. So I started thinking a lot about the domestic analogy and its place in the debate and whether it is true that there is only one-sided influence from democratic theory to international thought. And I also learned in the earlier research that some other thinkers did take in op international observations and then from the um, or implemented them within democratic 
arguments and this is how I arrived at the term international analogy in order to describe the arguments. Other authors have used the term as well but um, I think we uh, came up with the term independently. So this is kind of my background how I arrived at international analogies. However, I'd like to make one disclaimer and I'd like to be there also very straightforward. International analogies are very are com somehow complicated like domestic analogies because I think Hedley Bull was really right when he said about the domestic analogy might be a good starting point for an argument, it is never a good end. I think I would go even a bit farther. I think an analogy, the analogies that I saw kind of overestimate the domain where the knowledge is produced and underestimate the domain um, to which the knowledge is applied. So I'm interested in an international analogies because I'm interested in interactions between democratic thought and IR theory, but not because I want to defend these arguments in the normative sense. Um, so I think this is very important to make that quite clear. So I'd like to say a little bit about domestic analogies, what kind of analogies are there and link it to a smaller but existing debate about international analogies and then look at three cases where I believe that we have quite a lot of interaction between international thought and democratic theory and I will look at the balance of power concept doing a selective interpretation and on at the League of Nations and global reconfigurations and debates about functional representation. As I said, I um, believe that domestic analogies today are most common in the debates about cosmopolitan democracy. However, there's also, and I like to begin with this, a quite well established criticism of domestic analogies in general. And I think some points might be worth raising again. So domestic analogies, broadly put, are said to be a problem because they hindered historical and sociological approaches to international relations because they somehow universalize the state without asking where states are coming from. They often also imply a strict difference between the domestic and the international um, level and do not allow unbiased research to IR, IR. So this is what a lot of um, critics of the domestic analogy in general say. I think when one looks at the debates about cosmopolitan democracy, one can also see that they often modernize pluralist approaches to um, democracy and somehow forget a lot of the pluralist thought um, that evolved in the beginning of the 20th century. So I think this is the very broad criticism of um, domestic analogies. And I think one can also observe that the term is used in an ever broader way. So Hidemi Zuganami was very careful in defining the international, uh, the domestic analogy, again, as a form of presumptive reasoning that takes knowledge from one area to another. And he distinguished it from other kinds of arguments, such as metaphors and logical deductions. From what I see in the debate, I think the term is applied in an ever broader way and I find it therefore quite necessary to, um, to distinguish between different kinds of arguments and different, um, different analogies. So everybody thinks about the classical domestic analogy as the argument that compares states to individuals in the state of nature. And then the argument says, well, states are also rational actors, and in order to overcome the state of nature, they need to submit sovereignty to a common authority in order to overcome that state of nature. So it's obviously based on the personification of the state, and it is embedded in contractual theory. So one can call it a classical domestic analogy, one can also call it a state of nature analogy, I believe. There is no, or references to domestic institutions, real world domestic institutions are not really necessary to 
to do the argument. Institutional domestic analogies include these references and they can be partial or full-fledged resulting in a real state proposal and come in different forms. So the so-called police analogy saying we need an international authority with a rapid deployment force was very popular for a time. I think right now the most important institutional domestic analogy is um, the proposal for a global parliament, which is also, I think, the most, yeah, which is in the debate about transnational or cosmopolitan democracy, rather the most important argument. And I need to say that I'm rather critical about it because I think basically it, it makes a snapshot of a well established Western democracy and then suggests to reproduce these institutions at, at a global scale. I think it distracts us from asking a lot of important problems that are linked to um, the proposal. It also leaves, I mean, it claims to really be a very practical or the most practical proposal, but actually it remains rather vague and leaves a lot of important questions unanswered, such as what would be the relation to bottom-up approaches to democratization, what would be the path dependencies that are created, how would the, par uh, the parties work, and so on. Um, so I would um, take the side of the, definitely take the side of the critics to, um, to this proposal. Other analogies are narrative analogies, and I think they become ever more common. I think a narrative domestic analogy is an analogy that refers to the domestic democratization process and then identifies a causal precondition for transnational democratization. So a very common story goes from feudal authority to the state to democratization and says, well, first you need to have an authority and then this can be democratized and if you have functional authorities, it won't work. There is in, in the debate a move away from institutional thinking to value-based approaches to transnational democracies. They also try to put forward or to place more interested in the process of democratization. So this might be a reason to wonder whether narrative analogies might be more important or might become more important. I just take this um, classification as a starting point to define what I see or what I understand as international analogies and also to relate them to existing other arguments that also speak about international analogies. And they come when we think about the state of nature analogy and the personification of the state and then the reverse comparing individuals to state in two forms in, in the literature. So, one argument says that if we go back to the most important state of nature argument, which is, of course, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, we will see that it is based on an earlier international analogy. Because what Hobbes does in that text is he compares the, state, the individuals in the state of nature to states. So I think if we really have a look at the text carefully, we will see that Hobbes does not compare them to states, but to persons of sovereign authority. I think that's an important qualification not to eternalize the state. I think another thing that we see if we look at uh, Hobbes' text is that he works with quite a lot of metaphors and arguments throughout the book. So I would buy, or I agree with the claim that is, it is important to look at this Hobbes' comparison of natural individuals to sovereign individuals, but not to overestimate the argument, not say, well, this is basically will question everything that we have learned about Hobbes and what he and his impact on international law and so on. Another argument is, um, and this is very much based on an interpretation of Bourdieu's, is it is a contextualist reading basically saying, if we look at the language of rights, rights, we will see that they were first applied to states and linked to a discourse about state sovereignty. And then thinkers like Bushes 
borrowed from this discourse and applied the same language to individuals in order to advance the idea of individual rights and also of individual autonomy. So this is of course an argument that would fit very well with my interest in international analogies, however I'm not convinced by the very strong claim that we should take the, uh, take the comparison or the analogy as a reason or as a cause for thinking about um, individual autonomy. I think this is stretch too far and I would rather speak here of transmissions of vocabulary but also allow that a lot of different things um, come in when speaking about individual autonomy and civil rights. I defined institutional international analogies and I need to say that here is really my interest. I'm mostly interested in institutional analogies because they reduce and organize modern experiences. Um, I define them as a form or as proposals that arrive at domestic reform proposals on the basis of international level experiences. And I here include experiences or institutions that take place between states, but also between within international organizations. So these might be seen as two kinds of level. I will talk, or I'm mostly interested in them, and I will um, see how I, where I see them and where I not. I will do that in two contextualizing discussions. I think it is, however, when talking about domestic and international analogies, very important to see that it is very often hard to say whether there is an, only a domestic analogy or only an international analogy, that there are a lot of intermediate cases somehow or sometimes the intermediate cases can be the most interesting ones. Um, I think they remind that there are no, or have seldom been, not often been strict domestic international um, distinctions. And an intermediate case might be um, thinking about the empire as in terms of the state in a way that makes it hard to distinguish, well, is it, is it a domestic analogy or not, or thinking about the idea then of Greater Britain. I think federalism and federalist theory is also um, a point where we see a lot of interactions between international thought and democratic thoughts. So I think very often there are transmissions of vocabulary, and I use the concept of an international analogy in order to structure my th search. However, I'm very happy or I do allow most of the times that this is not a strictly defined analogy, but we have here rather contact and interaction between democratic and IR theory. So I believe there would, is quite a lot of, or would be quite a lot of material to, to look at, and I restrict my discussion to basically three cases. And um, the first is the balance of power. I like to start with the balance of power because Stanley Hoffman, um, in one essay defining where IR starts, said, well, IR is very much, or starts where democracy ends because IR remained, and international rema relations remained for a long time, the business of kings and soldiers. Well, and the business of kings and soldiers was very often described in terms of balance of power. So I take this as a starting point. And the first thing that I need to see or that I would like to recognize is balance of power as a policy in a context and it's huge discourse. And I only make very, I um, try to make basically only three points of it, uh, three points. And in making these three points, I work a lot with well, classical realists, also English school literature, but also recent studies on the balance of power, such as Daniel Deutner's bounding power. And I think what is very interesting, because balance of power is often understood as a realist term and reduced to the idea of counterbalancing hegemony, is, well, there is also, first of all, kind of a liberal tradition of balance of power thinking and that it is 
by not um, by far not only a realist term but a term or a concept that really was introduced into democratic thought and first of all all, if we go back to the rise of modern balance of power thinking, one f needs to see that those who introduced it did not make stark in national, international distinctions, is what raised when writers conceived of Europe as a Christian republic and a Christian community or as a republic, and that it was first applied to the European level and, of course, the business of kings, but that it had the somehow ironical or paradoxical effect that it raised a public or, what, or a discourse about European politics, about other societies, but also their own society. And some thinkers here take it very far and say, well, it was really the international discourse and international balance of power thinking that also structured the thought of, of the, or about the domestic community. Um, when I go to the, the literature, I think I would not make the, ter the claim that strong because I think references to the Roman constitutions are also there and play a role, so that would be a domestic analogy. I think some, pe some thinkers first start with the international relations and then provide a kind of analogical argument. But in a lot of cases, is it is hard to say what is more important. So um, Herbert Butterfield very much was interested in balance of power and very much all described and I think nicely described then what happened. And he said, well, the mechanics, mechanics of the European order, the design of the whole machine, was sometimes a complex affair. And some writers described wheels within wheels. It is possible to conceive of many local systems of balance of power and to comprehend all these in a wider system of European balance. I think, think that nicely catches what, um, <coughs> what was going on. So I think this is the first point I like to make about the balance of power. The second is that um, balance of power thinking in different ways is also in evident in the federal paper, and I think Daniel Dortney did very much um, showed and provided a new interpretation of how it interacted and how the federalist included international balance of power thinking, but then also adopted it, and that in the federalist paper, as, and that they, it was the thinking about balance of power eventually in terms of different parts of government, but also scales. I think the importance of scale is something that is quite often forgotten. So I here very much follow the literature, however, I also add um, my own analysis of early 20th centuries, thinking of balance of power to it, and I here concentrate on early 20th century American and British radicals and left liberals and um, thinkers such as Tony um, Mitrani and Frank Tannenbaum who was um, American sociologist and he also contributed frequently to foreign affairs. What one can see there is that all of them adopted and defended their own kind of balance of power thinking in order to make a democratic statement in order to reflect about class relation or class conflict in Britain, then comparing international and industrial warfare, saying, well, you have only an unstable peace as long as there are no compensations, or in order to reflect the experience of state totalitarianism. This is very much evident in Frank Tannenbaum's essay on the balance of power in society, which he published in 1946 where he borrows from an earlier positive understanding of balance of power in order to say that you need to have strife among functional groups in society um, so that none of these groups in the state is then only one can become the dominating one. For Frank Tannenbaum it is important 
that this balance of power in society is also reflected at an individual level um, so that you can balance your different group loyalties. So it is kind of a twofold balance of power that he theorizes. The concept also was integrated in the democratization literature. And I think, or I take it to show um, that basically balance of power has a long historic has a long history and that it became part of thinking about democracy and also um, about democratization. The I then um, have two other historical cases or debates where I look at and they are a little different because they are not so much about conceptual history, but I do provide a contextualizing interpretation of two debates which take place after I was established as an academic science and also after democracy became the standard to define legitimate governance. So the first debate is about the League of Nations and liberal reconfigurations. I'd like to make here a short note on historiography because I believe that we should be very careful not to believe that a lot of, you know, it's always said the so-called ideals were very, very enthusiastic about the League of Nations. I found they were first quite critical of the League, but the League then turned into a role model to domestic reform in the 1930s. I think two factors are important for this development. I think the first is that, that a lot of early IR thinkers, also Alfred Simon, who had the first chair of IR in Aberystwyth, was somehow affiliated with the League and the League functional committees. And the other was that there was a crisis of liberal democracy, um, as, as it is said. And the main question was how one could reconcile liberal democracy with the need of state, uh, with the need of economic intervention. And what there happened is that the League functional expert committees were thought as a new form of governance that should also be implemented at the domestic level within British democracy. So Simon very much made the argument and praises expert de deliberation, I think in terms of, on the one hand, efficiency, but also because it depolitizes the, um, the debate. And to him, it was a way to um, to balance knowledge and participation in a modern democracy. Another thinker, Arthur Sorter, who was a ter very, very important international civil servant and who was professor at Oxford, also looks at the League of Nations in order to make an argument for expert governance in modern democracies. He wants to have expert governance at the expense of parliament. He's made a quite straightforward proposal in order to argue for an economic advisory council. And he promoted this and advanced that proposal in Britain at several occasions, but it was not successful. However, his ideas had an impact in, in China because Sorter also served as an international advisor to the government of China. And here, um, contributed to a quite short-lived economic advisory council. I think it's quite needless to say that Salter looked at European institutions and reflected about them and then um, went to China without really rethinking it. Another debate is between federalists and functionalists. It is again, or it takes place in the 50 and it is again about the idea of of domestic and regional parliaments. And I here focus on David Mitrani's argument. Edim Ziyoganami also worked on Mitrani in his book, The Domestic Analogy. And he discusses Mitrani as a welfare internationalist that makes domestic, or that uses domestic analogies, with, but who opposes the personification of the state. And I think it's important to say that Mitrani opposed territorial domestic analogies, but used other ones. However, he also argued along the lines of international analogies. And 
he wrote quite a lot about parliamentary democracy um, in the 50s. In order to argue against the idea of, a, of regional and global parliaments, Mitrani cites the UN Charter and um, as a, an important step to the possible solution of the problem of representation, and he obviously referred to functional representation. And he builds that argument on, I think, quite sophisticated critique of parliamentary democracy, according to which parliamentary democracy and territorial representation was justified when it was introduced. But then with the rise of the welfare state, parliament lost the ability to really control the administration that it had created. And also, it ceased to coexist with an enlightened public discourse, as Mitrani um, was wondering. I think he has also a concern whether what some think has then described as Mao's opinion has an affiliation with nationalism. So Mitrani based his argument for functional representation in the domestic sphere on the UN Charter and it basically, he aimed, I think, at three things. So he wanted to re-establish the democratic control of administrative conduct within the welfare state. He wanted to ensure efficiency, but he also wanted to further transnational interests because he believed that this was de would denationalize the public sphere and the political discourse. And I think for Mitrani, this was very much an, an aim in itself. Um, he was quite balanced when it came to making the argument for functional representation and also all it was linked to empirical observations to NGOs. However, he didn't raise a number of subjects or didn't raise a number of subjects that we would discuss today. Mitrani somehow figures still as um, one thinker who advanced transnational democracy and here he is often referred to as an advocate of technocracy, technocracy or of expert debate. And I think um, the argument has made recently, I think that this is very mu much only part of the story and that his thought is much more complex in, in many ways. So I believe that this is uh, what I present is very much, you know, just a beginning and a look at, well, where do, well, how far does the concept of international analogy takes us and to problemize the kind of distinctions that I see between democratic and our thought. As I said, I'm still troubled with the concept of an analogy because one does not do doesn't really not do defend it. Um, I think the more analogies I, I, I've seen or that I've studied, um, the, mo the more I want to problemize them. From what I have seen so far, I think that one can see no last or no lasting impacts in the sense, well, here it was only international thought or the interaction between international democratic thoughts that, that somehow had a lasting effect. I think it is worth pointing to the balance of power and also to the fact that deliberation and functional representations are democratic topics that ever again um, appear when one reflects in transnational politics and links it to dem um, democratic debates. So what I want to do so far is that I'd rather take it as an as an kind of story to tell another story about international relations thinkers in especially um, at the beginning of the early 20th century in order to point out how much their thought interacted or was shaped by democratic theory and I think it holds true also for a number of classical realists. I think one misses a lot if one does um, not read Reinhold Niebuhr's and others' thoughts on democracy. And I think this relationship between IR and democratic theory somehow came to an end 
with the rise of behavioralism in international relations. And then they again came to interact in the 90s. So I want to um, show the interactions and problemize the reading a bit. However, I do know very much that I, this is at the start um, and that the that the, there also needs to be more framing and taming of of the whole argument and its Lovely. Thank you very much, Leonie.